Sukadev Goswami, the son of Vyasadev, was also full in transcendental knowledge and a great devotee of Lord Krishna, son of Vasudeva. So there must have been discussion of Lord Krishna, who is glorified by great philosophers in the company of great devotees. Hmm. Discussion of Lord Krishna, who is glorified by great philosophers in the company of great devotees. The word satam is very important in this verse. Satam means the pure devotees who have no other desire than to serve the Lord. Only in the association of such devotees are the transcendental glories of Lord Krishna properly discussed. It is said by the Lord that his topics are full of spiritual significance. And once one properly hears about him in the association of the satam, Certainly, one senses the great potency, and so autom certainly one senses the great potency, and so automatically attains to the devotional stage of life. <clears throat> As already described, Maharaj Pariksit was a great devotee of the Lord from his very birth, and so was Sukadev Goswami. Both of them were on the same level. Although it appeared that Maharaj Pariksit was a great king accustomed to royal facilities, whereas Sukadev Goswami was a typical renouncer of the world, so much so that he didn't even put on, put on cloth on his body. Superficially, Maharaj Pariksit and Sukadev Goswami might seem to be opposites, but basically they were both unalloyed, pure devotees of the Lord. When such devotees are assembled sit together, there can be no topics save discussions of the glories of the Lord or Bhakti Yoga. In the Bhagavad Gita, also, when there were talks between the Lord and his devotee Arjun, there could not be any other topic other than Bhakti Yoga. However, the mundane scholars may speculate on it in their own ways. The use of the word cha after Vyasaki suggests according to Shiva Goswa, Jiva Goswami, that both Sukadev Goswami and Maharaj Pariksit were of the same category, settled long before, although one was playing the part of the master and the other one the disciple. Since Lord Krishna is the center of the topics, the word Vasudeva Parayanaha, or devotee of Vasudeva, suggests devotee of Lord Krishna, the common aim. So they both had the common name. They were both devotees of Krishna. Although there were many others who assembled at that place where Maharaj Pariksit was fasting, the natural conclusion is that there was no topic other than the glorification of Lord Krishna. Because the spe principal speaker was Sukadeva Goswami and the chief audience was Maharaj Pariksit. So Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was spoken and heard by two principal devotees of the Lord, is only for the glorification of the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobitam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Nirasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Manchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pieva Chapatitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai So there's a couple main points one that's being illustrated mostly throughout the purport is devotees may have any particular background in life or any particular occupation in life or any particular opulence in life and still become great devotees. Although the mood of devotional service 
as taught by the six Goswamis under the guidance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Vairagya. Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. Uh, what is that verse? Uh, hmm. uh, what is it? Satam Prasanga. No, that's not it. Uh, Mahaprabhu Bhakti Vinir Vairagya Pradhan. <laughs> Yeah, Mahaprabhu, Bhakti Vinir, Vairagi Padan, that the the life and soul of the Vaishnavas under the guidance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is renunciation. But Rupa Goswami gives a clearer understanding what is renunciation. He says, Nirbandi Krishna Sambandi Yukta Vairagya Uchjate. In other words, re, uh, renunciation really means to use everything in the service of the Lord. To simply renounce something and give it up is a kind of a renunciation. But if that's the only mood of practicing renunciation, then it's called incomplete. Real renunciation is, or complete renunciation, is to see everything in relationship to Krishna, even my own body, and see that it is meant for the service of the Lord. That is real renunciation. So we see such a diversity in the devotees of Lord Chaitanya, that we have Kolavetsu Sridhar, who was a banana salesman, living in a very meager position. He had uh, nothing, practically. Um, he lived in a, a little shack which had holes in it. When it would rain, the water would come into his little shack. Um, Basically, he had nothing to eat. He would beg whatever he needed. But he had one occupation. He used to make and collect banana leaves and make cups and leaves and plates and, and sell them for a few pice. And then he would give half to that profit to worship of the mother Ganges and the rest he would somehow or other get some food with. I mean, he was so poor that people would throw vegetables at him because at night he would just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra the whole night and he would chant so loudly that he would keep everybody awake this is good for the neighbors <laughs> so when they would they would say Sridhar you're hungry your belly is just yelling so here take this and they would throw a, a piece of squash or a gourd at him eat it and, sh and be quiet we want to sleep <laughs> He would just continue to chant. So that was Sridhar. He had practically nothing. And he was in that mood. He didn't really want anything. He simply wanted to serve. That was his whole thing. And Lord Chaitanya used to come every day and say, Sridhar, you know, uh, you got some really nice banana cups, banana leaves. And so how much are you asking for? And so... Sridhar would quote some price, and the Lord would say, too much. You're cheating the brahmanas. <laughs> I know, actually, you have a great wealth, and it's hidden. It's a great treasure, and someday I'm going to expose that treasure. Sridhar would say, no, no, no. What you see is what I am. This is all I had. Sridhar, we know, we all know, you have this hidden treasure. So this would go back and forth. And sometimes Lord Chaitanya would, uh, when Sridhar would give a price, the Lord would say too much, and he would just take the, the banana, banana cups of banana leaves and give him nothing. But because he was so beautiful, Gaurasundar, you know, his beautiful body, with eyes that reach almost to his ears, golden complexion, and long arms down to his knees, uh, Sridhar would become really enchanted by the, by the Lord's form, not knowing he was the Lord, of course. He would think he was just some very important brahmana. And so they would go back and forth. So during the Mahaprakash Leela, 24 or 21 hours, when the Lord exhibited his mood as the Supreme Personality of God, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was always in the mood of being the devotee. He didn't want to be known as the Supreme Lord. He wanted to be worshipped. He didn't want to be worshipped. Why? Although he was the Supreme Lord, that particular incarnation has a couple reasons why. 
one of the reasons, the ex external reason is that people would very, what we say, surreptitiously or pretentiously claim to be God. And they would say, you know, you practice this yoga, you do this meditation, you chant these mantras, and then after some time, you're the supreme. Mm -hmm. So the Lord wanted to come and destroy this, what we say, mayabad, and what we pretentious uh, attitude towards, uh, you know, practicing spiritual life. So when, when someone would refer to him as the Supreme, he would hold his ears, block his ears and say, no, no, I am not God, I'm simply the servant of God. But he was God. So he did that just to somehow rather decrease this, what we say, cheating mentality that people were adopting. And so when he had his Mahaprakash Lila, the Lord came out as the Lord. And that's, that's a beautiful pastime in the Chaitanya Bhagavat, which goes on for many, many, many verses. I think there's hundreds of verses that describe this particular Leela. And the Lord was in the mood of giving out everything to everyone. He was asking the devotees, take a benediction, whatever you want, ask from me. And But the devotees were so humble that they were saying, well, my Lord, uh, give me pure devotional service uh, give me pure devotional service for my father my friend uh let me have you know unalloyed devotion to you you know they would all only speak about getting bhakti but the lord was in, inclined to uh, to push so many times he would you know ask them come on take some benediction so this went on for 21 hours towards the end of the the uh, satsang that they had, the Lord said to his devotees, go in that direction. He pointed and he said, call Sridhar. Just go in that. And they said, who's Sridhar? Just call, go, go, just call his name. Sridhar, come. Mahaprabhu wants to see you. Come, come. So devotees were running and calling. And then her Sridhar heard his name. Oh, Mahaprabhu wants to see me. Okay. So he came. You know, he had a, he had only had one piece of cloth. He would wear that. At night he would wash it, and the next day he would wear the same piece of cloth. When I joined the Hare Krishna movement, that was like that. <laughs> when we had we had nothing. In fact, we would someone would bring in a towel, and they would take the towel and cut it into four pieces, and then you'd each get one quarter of that towel, and that was your towel. And for laundry, whatever clothes there were, everybody threw it into one big basket, and then they wash it, and then you might get the same thing, but most of the time you got something different <laughs> once it was washed. <laughs> so, you know, I think I had one dhoti, that's all I had, so I used to wear it during the day, and at night I wash it, and the next day we put it on again. <laughs> so we, we had nothing. This was in New Vrindavan. So life was quite simple. And so Sri Kolavetra Sridhar, he was like the personification of renunciation. He had nothing practically. But he had bhakti. So when he came and saw Mahaprabhu and realized he was the Supreme Lord, he fainted in ecstasy. That same person who was coming to bargain with him for his banana cups and banana leaves now he saw as the supreme personality of Godhead. So now he's really like, well, like uh, emotional. So the Lord, after he comes back to consciousness, the Lord said, Sridhar, Sridhar, you're such a, a sincere and dedicated devotee of Lord Krishna. Please ask for some benediction, whatever you ask for. And Sridhar said, well, actually, my Lord, I actually don't really want anything. I'm happy. No, no, this is the nature of the Lord. He likes to serve his devotees, so he likes to give things to his devotees. So it was going back and forth. Finally, the Lord said, you want a planet? I'll give you a planet. Take an island, a nice wife, some money. And, you know, he was offering so many things to the Lord, to uh, Sridhar. And Sridhar finally said... Uh, 
my dear Lord, why are you making my life difficult? <laughs> I'm happy. How am I going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> it becomes complicated. <laughs> life is nice. I simply sell my banana cups and banana leaves, worship Mother Ganges, and chant the holy name. I'm happy. <laughs> Don't give me all this other stuff. Basically, that's what he said. When the Lord heard that, he was so pleased with Sridhar. And he blessed him with, uh, with spontaneous loving service to the Lord. And then we have another disciple or follower of Lord Chaitanya. His name was uh, Pundarik Vidyaniti. Now, Pundarik Vidyaniti, <clears throat> when you would see him, you would think, wow, what a materialist. He was dressed in very fancy clothes. His hair was like combed very nicely, and he would put oils in his hair to, to make it smell nice. And sometimes he would look in the mirror and smile and look at himself, and then he would chew betel nut. You know, he was like, when you would look at him, you'd just think he's just like a very gross materialist. But he is actually a great devotee. So when uh, Lord Chaitanya realized that Pundavik Vidyanidhi had come to Navadweep, he sent Gadadhar Pandit to meet Pundarik Vidyanidhi. So Gadadhar Pandit went with Mukunda. So they both came. Of course, Mukunda knew who Pundarik Vidyanidhi was, but Gadadhar didn't. So when they were sitting there, uh, you know, Mukunda was telling Gadadhar, well, here's Pundarik Vidyanidhi, he's such a great devotee. Now, they went to his place, and he was living in this very palace-like building, and he had servants, bedsteads, nice curtains, draperies, flower pots, everything was so nice and decorated, opulent. And then Gadadhar is sitting there and he's looking and he's thinking, great devotee, <laughs> looks like a materialist. <laughs> so the Mukunda could understand the mind of Gadadhar. So he's recited one verse <clears throat> from the, uh, it's also from this section of the Bhagavatam. Third, it's in the third canto, actually the very beginning of the third canto, second chapter. And this verse is in glorification of Krishna killing Putana witch, a whole bakiyam kalastala kutam. The first line, a whole bakiyam kalastana, a whole bakiyam stana kala kutam. That uh, baki is actually witch, and uh, Krishna, when she came, Putana. She was a witch, and she came to kill Krishna, but she offered her breast milk, which was smeared with poison, and Krishna shook, sucked out the milk and sucked out her life at the same time. And she received, it says, almost on the level of Mother Yasoda, she received liberation that high. So he started to chant this verse over and over again, and when Pundarik Vidyaniti heard the chanting of that verse, he went into ecstasy. And he started to roll on the ground, start to call out the names of Krishna really loudly. And then he was he was just beyond himself in emotions. And then he started ripping his own clothes and start throwing things around in the room, breaking the mirrors, <laughs> everything. It was just like it went on for six hours. Six hours he was in ecstasy, just thinking about Krishna. And Gadadhar is watching this whole thing, and he's really realizing, oh my God, I must have committed a great offense thinking he was just a materialist. Finally, after six hours, um, Pundarik Vidyanidhi, he was, realized what happened, so he sat very humbly. <laughs> he became a real, really peaceful. And then Mukunda turned to him and said, oh, you know, this Gadadhar, he actually wants to become your disciple. And of course, uh, Pundarik Vidyanidhi looked and said, oh, Gadadhar, my disciple? 
rare is there a spiritual master that gets such a wonderful disciple as Sri Gadadhar Pandit. I am honored. So, and of course, this is an interesting pastime because Gadadhar Pandit is Radharani who incarnated in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And Pundarik Vidyanidhi is Vrishabhanu who came in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes and he was King Vrishabhanu the father of Radharani in the previous Leela with Lord Krishna and Vrindavan. So father and daughter have become united in spiritual master and disciple. So we see from this example the difference between Kolavetsha Sridhar and Pundarik Vidyanidhi. And here the same comparison is being made between Sugadev Goswami and Maharaj Pariksit. Such diverse lives, but still, it's not the external thing that really makes the difference. It's the heart. So a devotee is not seen so much by external dress as they are by their actual commitment in devotional service. That is the real, what we say, characteristic of a devotee. And many times... Most of the times, not many times, one cannot tell on what level of practice a devotee is until they associate with that devotee for some time. <clears throat> Just by seeing the external, sometimes we have the tendency to judge or to, to make, make some comment. And then we somehow or other realize later we were wrong, which is mostly always the case. So everything is should be seen in terms of... Not so much the external, but what is the internal mood of that person and how that is exhibited by their devotional practice. <clears throat> Another point that was made here is that, <clears throat> that glories of the Lord can only be properly enunciated in the assembly of Vaishnavas, and especially great Vaishnavas. <clears throat> The word satam is, is used in this verse means devotees. Then we have that verse from the Bhagavatam, satam prasangam mamavirya sambido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata. Rasayana means sweet, nectar, juicy, very relishable. Kata means talk. And rit means heart and karna means ear. So in the association of devotees, pure devotees, the topics of the Lord are like nectar for the heart and for the ear. So this is how devotional service is actually uh, performed. If persons who are scholarly academicians get together and discuss the topics of the Lord, that is not satam, that is not assembly they cannot understand. They may have some intellectual, what we say, analysis of what Krishna's pastimes are. And they write about that in a very, what we say, philosophical way. But they can't. It's like trying to, as Bhakti Ben Siddhanta used to say, it's like trying to taste the honey while you're licking the outside of the bottle. <laughs> You have to open the bottle and get to the contents. So those who make a show, well, they, they don't think they're making a show, but they are, of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, and if they're not devotees of the Lord, it's simply, it's just assembly of crows, that's all. <laughs> but therefore, the topics of the Lord only can be discussed in the assembly of devotees. So... That's what this point is being made here over and over again. How when talks between devotees, when devotees come together, there can be no other talks. We were reading just some of the verses beforehand where when it says that people in Indian, what we say cultured India, traditional India, anytime they would gather in Lord gathering, large gatherings, no matter what the gathering was, whether it was a drama a political meeting, or any type of gathering, the topics of the Lord were the main main focus for everyone. 
even in the schools in India in traditional days, the topics were always centered around Mahabharata, Ramayan, Srimad Bhagavatam. Now we see as society goes on, becomes more and more affected by the industrial revolution and uh, economic gains, people are learning technology. <laughs> how to you know plug in a computer how to push the button how to make different kinds of uh, what we say <laughs> formulas from your computer um, Prabhupada said uh, engineer because people they get this IT engineer degree engineer Prabhupada said is simply sudra and so it's sudra work it's mechanical it doesn't have it doesn't take any kind of it takes material intelligence, but material intelligence is can be gained simply by practicing that. But spiritual intelligence is real intelligence. So nowadays, people have given up the tradition of culture and devotion in order to learn how to make money through technology. Nowadays, especially I travel all over in, in America and in America, we find so many of the young men who come from India, yeah, you don't even have to ask. They're all IT experts. <laughs> they know everything about computers. If you have computer problems, just look for an Indian. <laughs> the Westerners don't know so much as the Indian. They someday, they're learning also. But if you go to Google, Apple, or any of those big companies, you see all the people working are either Indian or Chinese, mostly, mostly Indian. A few Chinese are in there too. <laughs> so, yeah, even so that when Donald Trump was trying to bring down the, uh, what we say, the uh, immigrations coming from other countries, and they were worried that this would affect the big IT corporations because they needed the Indians who were the best. They have the brain to work these computers where the Westerners take so long to learn and sometimes they never learn. So yeah, so but what is the value? You know, there's no, the real giving up the goal of life in order to have to have a nice material arrangement is really taking life in a direction where one still has to struggle like that struggle and suffer so i just wanted to make that point how everything in traditional culture was centered around the glories of the lord nobody met otherwise otherwise unless the the topics of the lord were actually the main point of gathering that was culture just like it says, drama, this is in the Vedas, drama, music, art, um, what is that, archaeology, dance, everything has a spiritual origin. None of these things, maybe there might be a few sciences that are coming from by what, by what we call uh, you know, material arrangements, but mostly everything is coming from Vedas. Even even how to fight, that's Dhanurveda, uh, medicine, Ayurveda. <laughs> all kinds of, the Vedas cover all kinds of activities, and especially the arts, like that. Hmm. Like that. So everything centered around spirituality in its original form, but now it's gravitated down into a, a secular mood where things are being used now for simply for making money and so on. Therefore, people are suffering. Okay, so I'll stop here. Um, see if there's any questions or comments. Yes, uh, Gabriel. Thank you for the lecture, Your Holiness. Uh, when was the breakdown of, of this modern civilization? Where, where, where did it break down? 
uh, where was this cut that we don't understand why did Darwin gave us this theory and people believed it that there wasn't this high civilization like the Vedas like yeah. the Vedic culture well, was Darwin, this the Kurukshetra battle or was no, there that was way after a bigger that. Bur breakdown the, can the we breakdown uh, came way after that Kurukshetra battle was the time of Lord Krishna there's two theories about the breakdown of the Vedic culture. One, the Brahmins became corrupted. And when the Brahminical class came, became corrupted and started following Brahminical class in a dogmatic way. In other words, if you were born in a Brahmin family, you were a Brahmin. Not by quality, but by birth. Then they started the whole caste system. Therefore, they were pushing people outside who were who are not born in Brahman as we untouchables or outcasts. So Brahmins developed this real, uh, what we say, arrogant and very proud attitude because of having birth in the Brahmin families. And then everything changed based on that. So that was taken advantage of by when the Islamic army came into India. What happened was because the uh, other persons who were not Brahmins, they couldn't, they weren't allowed to worship because they weren't Brahmins. And therefore, they were being rejected even by their own society, by the Hindu society. And so, uh, Aranzeb, when he came in, he, Prabhupada talks about this, how he said that if you, if you, uh, if you convert from Hindu to Islam, We'll give you a financial donation. And then, and so because the Hindus were being ousted by their own culture, the, by the Brahmins, they thought, all right, well, we're not even being accepted by our own culture and we're getting an offer to change our culture. We actually are being accepted by another culture and we're also getting financial benefit from it. So Rangzeb did that and converted thousands and thousands of Hindus. And that 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 somewhat broke down some of the, the the Vedic culture slightly, but it was all due to the Brahmins' arrogance. They started to push people out. Women were not allowed to worship. Uh, Sujars were not allowed to worship. Brahm, only Brahmins were allowed to worship. It says that a Brahmin, if he saw a Sudra, then he would have to go inside, take a bath, and. If that sutra came into his house, then he would have to take the whole house and and, and wash it with cow dung. So this was the pretentious attitude that and arrogance that really started it. Darwin came later. Darwin is a product of the British. The British sent Darwin in there to destroy the whole educational system. That came in the you know during the eighteen. Darwin was born in eighteen forty nine. Or he was, yeah. No, his teachings were became popular around 1840s, like that, in India. But that was recent. That's only 170 years ago. But the breakdown of the culture became way before that. Gradually, gradually, gradually. And then the Hindu and Muslim division. Hindus and Muslims used to live very. Uh, very close together and they were good friends but then the British used that to divide India between Hindu and Muslims and so they created animosity between these two cultural groups two religious groups and then the British really messed up India really quite bad they 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 taught that Indians were primitive that their whole educational system was just simply mythology we have to introduce you know, Western education, we we're educating them, and that's how they justified their colonialism. The rest of the world was saying, what are you doing in India? They were saying, we're helping them out. They're poor, they need, they don't have any education, we're, we're, we're bringing them up to a civilized society. That was the propaganda. And what the British did in India was just horrendous, how they mistreated the Indians. The only thing they ever did in India, which may have any value, is they built a railway system <laughs> so they could transport their, the Indian goods outside of India and bring it into the Western countries anyway. 
So yeah, the breakdown came basically around the during the time of Arunzak, when, when the Brahmins were arrogant and pushing out their own people in the name of Brahminical culture. And then the whole caste system started like that. Caste system means if whatever birth you are, that is your varna. But actually it's not based on birth, it's based on what we say qualities. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wrote about that. Bhakti Vinod Thakur preached. It's not by birth, it's by qualities. <laughs> we see here, and just like a Vaishnava, also a Vaishnava should be not be seen. RJ Vishnu Siladi Guru Su Namrati Vaishnava Jati Bhuti. A Vaishnava is seen by their background. Oh, here is a Serbian Vaishnava. And here is an American Vaishnava, and here's a Croatian right? In other words, to put a label on Vaishnava is actually, uh, it's, it's materialistic. It has nothing to do with Vaishnava. Vaishnava is transcendental. So these, these material connections to spiritual principles has brought these spiritual principles down to a material understanding like that. So that happened gradually, and then eventually, you know, it wasn't during the time of Bhakti Siddhanta that they tried to bring that whole thing back again. So Prabhupada is doing the same thing now. He's teaching, Prabhupada's whole movement is Daivi Van Ashram, that you train people according to their nature, engage them according to that nature in devotional service, then they become transcendental. They're Brahmins, they're doing Brahminical work, but they're devotees. They're working in the garden, they're doing Vaishya work, but they're actually devotees. They're washing the floor, they're doing Sudra work, but they're actually devotees. So it doesn't matter what your occupation is or what your Varna is, what matters is what are your qualities. Your qualities. So we saw a whole, what we say, conscious uh, sabotage of the, the Vedic culture, mostly by the British. Mm -hmm. It came now into my mind as, as an answer while I was thinking about it, that always is a, is a virus or an epidemic, like is fault for a fall for a great culture like Egyptians or Vedic culture, that, that uh, a virus or, or a very big disease erased such things. Could that be that this was the complete destruction and erasement point of the societies, which well, were before the, the time we count now? The destruction of? Big cultures like Egyptians, very, very I don't really know much about the Egyptian culture. Culture can be destroyed in different ways. When people don't follow their tradition and, and adopt materialistic principles to apply to uh, spiritual activities, then culture seems to be, what we say, uprooted and redefined, just like morality is the same way. Nowadays, morality is defined according to what you want to be morality. But morality is actually the foundation for spirituality. So you can't redefine, you know, the principles that are mentioned in, in the Shastras. You have to understand them and apply them accordingly. So that's what's happening even now. But cultures and traditions, spiritual movements get destroyed by different, or get, get subverted. They're never destroyed, they're only subverted into the wrong direction, that's all. We have to watch that here. That's why Prabhupada understood one thing. 16 rounds, four regulative principles. That anything below that, you're still aspiring to be a devotee. You're not actually on the platform of devotion. You're aspiring, but only when you come to 16 rounds and four regulative principles, then you're actually practicing bhakti. 
before you could be considered to be an aspiring devotee if you're if you're below that standard that means you get a chance to move up that's why Prabhupada said this is the this is the lowest level you can't go below that below that means you're you're aspiring to become a devotee you're not actually on the devotional platform 16 rounds for relative principles <laughs> yeah so we have to have a standard if there's no standard everybody creates their own standard well my standard is this and your standard is that and that becomes fashionable Like that. So morality is redefined according to how people want to uh, benefit by the activities like that. Mm -hmm. Just like they have, you know, same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. So now it's considered to be legal in many countries now. So that, that if you do that, you're moral. And if you're against that, you're immoral. <laughs> Think about that. That's the complete opposite of this of God's arrangement for for the world. Marriage means children, husband and wife. The whole institution of marriage has been subverted into this idea that, is, you know, marriage can mean. Just to any two kind of people. I even saw one time, this was interesting, one person got married to a dog. Yeah, it was a formal ceremony. <laughs> they had a ceremony and he married a dog. Really? <laughs> it was in the newspapers. That was his wife or her husband. We don't know which one is which. <laughs> So, so this is this goes on in the name of you know advancement of civilization. But you have to have a standard, and the standard is the laws of God. And the laws of God applied to the laws of man are called Manusamita. So Manusamita is the law books by which society is governed. So when Prabhupada, when he established this movement, he understood that there has to be a, a basic principle. And above that, wonderful, below that, then you're aspiring to become like that. You're not on that level. So that, that keeps our movement from falling apart. As soon as we destroy the standard that's set by the Acharya, and the whole movement goes to hell. Mm -hmm. Because it's fashionable, people like to change. Oh, why four regulative principles? Why not three and a half? <laughs> Sometimes we joke, we say four regulative principles. No meat eating, no fish eating, no garlic, no onions. Four regulative principles. <laughs> But that's, you know, just a little, little bit of being facetious. So the idea is that, you know, these, are, these things are foundational. No one is criticized for being below the standard, but no one should think that I'm on the standard because uh, I'm following whatever level I can follow. No, that's fine, but you have to understand, you have to work towards that coming to that standard. And then, then you're on the platform of bhakti, or on the platform to practice bhakti. That's why Prabhupada said, initiation means beginning. How many times did he say that? So many times. Every initiation ceremony, he said, initiation means beginning. And what did he mean? You're, okay, you're practicing, you're not initiated, you're aspiring to come to the bhakti platform. You're welcomed, you're, in, you're, in, you're given everything you need to, to practice and to move forward. But until you get that, take shelter of the spiritual master, then bhakti doesn't go beyond a certain level. 
That's why it says, Adal Shara Saru Sangha Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya means initiation. Then, Anartha Nivritti. And from Anartha Nivritti, then you can make progress to Nishta and then gradually all the way up to Prema. And so, but it requires taking shelter of the spiritual master. That's not optional. That's why the verse, Tadvigyartam gurum eva abhigatsche. One must accept the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. And then from there, your devotional service becomes what we say blessed. You get the mercy of Krishna coming through the spiritual master, you get the guidance, you get so many benefits. Before then, you're not considered to be less, but you're considered to be still aspiring for the same for the for the bhakti platform. Like that. I keep repeating that because it's important that sometimes because a devotee is not initiated, they think, well, <clears throat> he's not initiated, he's not a devotee. No, he's an aspiring devotee. But if he doesn't want to, if he's not moving towards initiation, then he's really not even aspiring. You have to be thinking, what do I do? Or what qualifications I have to get in order to qualify myself for, you know, taking shelter of the spiritual master? We can take shelter at any time, but in order to receive the formal initiation, then one should think, what do I need to do? Which is easy. It's very easy. Chant 16 rounds, follow four relative principles, and be a nice, be a nice person. <laughs> we had that too. Be a nice guy or a nice girl. <laughs> in other words, work with other people who are doing the same thing in a cooperative way. These are all part of our practice of Krishna consciousness. So thank you for your question. That was really quite an uh, important question. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.